All right, everyone. Welcome to the latest episode of the Electrified News Podcast. We're already having a great time. It's uh, late today, apparently. I am your host, Joe Boris. I'm here with the mouthwatering Matt Teske, since we're <clears throat> flipping that around a little bit. I love and, the alliteration. Uh, yeah, the, well, alliteration is the best, I think. Yeah, I always like I that. It's like, the highest form of wordplay. M- mouthwatering <laughs> Matt and, and Juicy Joe, like, like you know, or something. <laughs> That would explain the juicy couture pants I'm wearing. I gotta say, when when you bedazzle things on you, more people are impressed. While I'm wearing them. So that brings us to Investor Day. <laughs> <laughs> that is, as, as uh, pivots and, and uh, segues go, mwah. no, it was a sparkling good time. Uh, I don't know. You seem to be more impressed than I was. You know, I gotta say, I didn't feel like I understood it at first. And I did, I made the mistake of trying to stay awake through the entire thing. Oh, that's your which, Yeah, no, <laughs> no, it was four hours of just nonsense. And I was watching it. And every time they would bring somebody up. So that what they're talking about, Tesla's investor day was supposed to unveil their like master plan version three, where they talk Rocket about energy. Electro. They show off robots and artificial intelligence. And then they tease a next gen EV that we don't actually get. And then they, showed like a doormat charger under the car in the garage that we also didn't actually get to talk about. There was uh, more ignoring of the fact that they took $250,000 orders for a roadster that nobody's ever going to get. Oh, and, uh, people will get it. It'll just not be next year. Yeah, they won't. <laughs> it won't be next year. When you go to Mars, it'll be there waiting for you. Well, it was uh, unveiled six, six years ago now was when they unveiled six it. Six years. Six years. Yeah. Since yeah. people put in their order. So, but you know, every time they trotted out someone new to get up there and talk about something, I was like more bored, like systematically more bored than the one before them. But yeah. by the end of it, I kind of got the message. And, and to me, the message was not necessarily that anything had changed at Tesla. I think it was the opposite, right? Like the message was like, you know, look, yeah, Elon is distracted. He's distracted by SpaceX. He's distracted by Twitter. He is. I was going to say, he's not distracted by SpaceX. He's distracted by Twitter. Twitter. You know, but he's kind of become this like polarizing cult of personality guy. He's taken a lot of heat. And I think there's a lot of investors who are like, who have questioned, do we want to be associated with this guy? And I think the point of industry day or investor day rather was to show that Tesla is not Elon Musk, that there are I, a lot yeah. of really bright people behind the scenes who are making real advances, who are thinking of things in a very reasonable and critical way. And mm-hmm. the company is just bigger and badder and more advanced than simply one guy. Uh, well, I, I, I was, I was wondering if that's what, you, what your take was going to be, because that was mine is by the end of it, you had this just, like parade of professionals and, you know, technologically, you know, smart people on stage with Elon going, yeah, we're running the show. Don't you worry. While well, he's, you know, distracted doing whatever the heck it is he's doing in his free time. We've got this on lock. And I think that was the point was to reinstill confidence in both, not just investors, but just like in, in, you know, in general of just like, look, we get, he's like been making you all squeamish, but right. these, are the, these are the people behind him that are actually, you know, keeping the house built. Right. We are know, the and, adults that are running the company. Yeah, this is the brain trust that is actually beyond what he decides to just say on Twitter. And I think that that was a, a very strategic play on their part. Uh, to your point, he, he, now, number one is he's no he's no Steve Jobs. Like, he does not present well. You know, oftentimes he's just kind of like, you know, making it up as he goes, it seems, you know, like it's not very planned out. And, but in contrast, the people that were brought on, they, to your point, they were kind of like, not near as exciting. They were very black and white about things, talking just about, you know, what makes the company function, which is also good. That's what they right. wanted to make sure they were in. But it wasn't hype day. It was investor day. And if you're going right. to put a ton of money into this company and you're going to continue to drive the stock price and continue to invest in the future that Tesla represents, or at least that Tesla, most people hope it represents, this was a really convincing kind of show of force that like there are some smart people here, maybe not in the optimist department. That thing still looks super janky, but in other yeah. departments, they seem to know what they're doing. No, I, well, I, that's part of the, 
they've got so many things that they've been working on over the years that people have said, like, you know, what is Tesla as a, as a core company? Is that an energy company? Are they a battery company? Are they a software company? Like, what are they? And there's, I think the take of, there's always been kind of that infographic that floats around on social media every now and then about how Tesla is kind of this monster of a bunch of different startups in, in some fashion. And I think that's very true if you really kind of, you know, look at the different touch points at how they're connecting the dots on those things is, is what's, I think, most impressive. Um, but yeah, this was, I mean, aside from the announcement of the Gigafactory in Mexico and really pointing to the fact that they don't, I mean, there was really no definitive information to your point about Roadster, Cybertruck-ish, maybe, hey, we're teasing out this other smaller EV, call us in a year. I mean, it was, there was a lot of, this felt very traditional corporate America as opposed to in the past where it's always been like, look, we, we just reinvented fire. You know, this, this was right. very much, this was very much. So we're making you feel at ease about the fact that we're a very valuable company and we are professionals here. I mean, that's, that's, yeah, I think your take on that was very accurate. So, well, you know, every once in a while, I uh, knock it out of the park here. Let's, let's be honest. <laughs> it is every once in a while, but, but overall, in a while. Yeah. overall. And I, I think the, the, the one thing that, you know, if we're sticking on the Tesla topic, as it always seems to happen, is the the Magic Doc announcement, which really wasn't part of Investor Day. It was more just kind of like, hey, we're, we kind of did this, was, I think, important. It got a lot of play inside of the, you know, the enthusiast, EV enthusiast world about, oh, my gosh, you know, you can charge your non-Tesla at a, at a Tesla supercharger now with a big asterisk on it, which is at these 10 locations, eight right. of them are in New York and two of them are in California. And... I think what they proved is that they have the ability to pivot and show how to fix problems within the industry and within the market. Um, also, there's a play on, you know, that's going to benefit them in the long run for, hey, does this work for getting Nevi dollars or, or some sort of, you know, grants or funding, obviously. But the people that I've talked to that have used the Magic Doc have been very, you know, very you know, clear about saying it was very elegant, very simple, not like it looks heavy and huge, but it wasn't. So I think that yet again, this is their engineering prowess saying, all right, like, let's just solve this other little thing for industry and see how it goes. But, you know, the issue is going to end up being that we don't have charging ports on the exact same spot of every car like in, a, in the United States. So it's already proving to be mayhem when people try to pull up and plug in with their non-Tesla vehicle and they're blocking two chargers trying to plug into one. It's just I, it's a pilot for a reason. They're going to they're going to yeah. get some learnings out of this. I mean, I don't know if you've been to a local Target or Walmart or big box store in the last, I don't know, 47 years that you've been on the planet, but most people have a hard time parking anyway. So I oh, think yeah. if you're trying to like line this thing up, it's going to be bad for a while. But, uh, you know, I'm surprised, um, you know, our mutual friend Brandon was one of the guys who was posting, uh, yeah. plugging his electric Mini Cooper into one of the superchargers. Um, mm -hmm. and, and that seemed really cool. The idea that like, you could buy a niche and I mean, like it doesn't get more niche than a, a mini Cooper EV no. or like a Harley live wire or something like you, you're driving this thing 40, 50 miles and that's it. And you're super yeah. happy with it. It's um, your weekend warrior thing. It's your yeah. weekend toy. Exactly. Right. Which is totally legitimate. Um, but to see like the super niche vehicle, just mosey on up to the largest charging network in North America, plug on in, like it's no big deal. That was really, really interesting because you can point to the Electrify Americas and the charge points and everybody else and say like, yeah, these guys have a, a, a huge footprint and all of this, but they don't have quite the locations, the dedication to it. And it, it's just really impressive. And you know what, what I also like about it is as these charging stations become available for CCS connectors, uh, you know, there's an app that's out there that records that and feeds that data into uh drivers do you, do you know what you think about that app mr uh, oh Fantastic? mr matt well this is the fun part watching everybody try to figure out how to navigate magic doc <laughs> you know <laughs> right. like and watching all the non-tesla owner groups on social media that someone would post something saying oh you can go to tesla supercharges now and the immediate confusion that came from it which was number one i can go to any of them no you can't go to any of them. You have to go to the right ones. Oh, how do I find the right ones? You have to download the Tesla app. Well, I don't have a Tesla. Why would I do that? What do, I have this other app. Can the other app show it? No, that app can't. So it was very just, you know, kind of hair pulling watching that happen. And from our side of Chargeway, we said, okay, we need to make sure we make this as easy as humanly possible to anybody who drives a non-Tesla. And so we paid attention to what was happening. A few things came out of the first testings of people plugging in, which was it's not going to be the same, you know, advertised kilowatt 
for every car based on things going on in the background. So all right. Like, cause some of the cars are 800, some are 400 volt. Oh, wow. Yeah. So we had to ensure that when we decided to add in a feature of the show, magic doc, how would we do it? That made the most sense to everyday, you know, everyday drivers that were not driving Teslas, but also for Tesla owners, making sure they had visibility into superchargers that offer magic doc. Because there are Tesla owners who are going to say, hey, I want to know if I pull up here, if I might encounter a non-Tesla owner who doesn't know what they're doing or took up two stalls or whatever it might be. So we we spent you know a few days working on making sure we got that right. And we're going to be you know, putting out some content about that probably today or tomorrow to show here's how you visualize this in a way that's easy if you're driving an EV6 or if you're driving a Mini Cooper, you know, electric or whatever it might be. Because if you're driving an EV6, for example, or a Lucid or um, an Ionic 5, you are not going to get a, a high power charge out of those superchargers because right. of your vehicle. And so we wanted to make sure we represented that correctly to those users. So if they see that, oh, wow, I can use this supercharger, they also know in chargeway lingo, it's like, well, yeah, that's not going to be a green level six. That's like right. a green level four. And you, I mean, for the nerds, they can figure out why with the voltage thing. But for everyday people, they're like, well, frankly, I could probably still go to that Electrify America station and have a better charging experience. So I want to charge faster. And the answer is, yeah. That's true. Now, Tesla has a more reliable network and more chargers, so they have more redundancy. But it's what's the trade-off? I know I, I, I've got a lot more confidence I can hook up and charge, but it's going to take longer. Or I just want to go and get a faster charge, the one that is obviously faster. So we wanted to make sure we represented that clearly in charge way with our update. And thus far from the feedback we've gotten from users is, yeah, like I didn't have to guess. You know, I get it. I can go yeah. to supercharger now, but it's waiting for me there too. Another thing... People kept asking, do I have to buy an adapter? It's like, no, it's built in. That's why it's magic. It's in, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's magical. You know, it's funny. In, in our generation growing up, maybe not our generation, I think we were probably Honda versus Mitsubishi, but certainly our parents' generation, there was, you know, the Ford versus Chevy argument. I recently was talking to someone who was asking me about an electric car. And I said, well, you know, you just, when you go to Walmart, you just plug in. And she said, oh, I, I can't do that. I can't go to Walmart. I have to get a Tesla because they're at Target and I go to Target. <laughs> and like that blew my mind that like now we're in the like the Target versus Walmart, you know, oh. preference wars. Well, and, and I got to be honest. I mean, you know, for Electrify America, for the rollout that they did, they needed to find a partner that had a large pavement footprint that they could tap into for sure. quickly getting permitting. Well, and the power, energy. too, because they and have the power. that power going to all that refrigeration and HVAC yeah. and all that other stuff. So yeah. I think that was the right partner and it was the right move for the overall mission of getting more people to drive EVs. I think Walmart was definitely the right partner. Um, I just never tell, expected anyone to care. Oh, I, I, I immediately knew they would care. Are you kidding me? I'm, I'm going to buy a $160,000. Yeah, I'm going to buy $160,000 Lucid Air. And when I go on a road trip, I'm going to be stopping and filling up at Walmarts. Like, talk, talk about not connecting the dots on who your owners are. Now, granted, that's not Lucid's fault per se. That's just no. what they tapped into. Oh, those guys go but, to Whole Foods. Right. Yeah. And Whole Foods, <laughs> it's like, do you guys have enough refrigeration that we can tap into the power you have on site? I mean, so, no, I mean, it, it's, uh, one again, once again, it's another example of what's happening in the landscape of charging that there's a lot to still figure out. Um, but again, I think we've got the right mousetrap for how to help people see how it works with their car they've chosen inside of Chargeway. So if you haven't done it yet, download the Chargeway app. Check it out. You can see where superchargers are that uh, work for your non-Tesla. And it makes it clearly obvious as to how it works for your car and not just in general. So, you know, we're talking about other EVs that are non-Teslas. And, and you made the point about buying that $170,000 Lucid Air and taking it to yeah. Walmart. What if you bought a $2 million Pininfarina Batista <laughs> <laughs> and the only charging place you could get it was Walmart? <laughs> That would, I mean, that takes that, that comparison and just kind of blows it out of the water, right? It's like, what are you doing here with a car that has two commas? Uh, just fill it up. <laughs> Dos commas. Dos commas, you know. But that, what was that zero to 60? Not, not zero to 60. It was a quarter mile. I don't even mile, think they timed the seconds? zero to 60, but it was the, yeah. the quarter mile was 855 out of oh. the box on DOT. I mean, they were, they were special tires. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. They weren't, you know, but, uh, you know, some, some DOT rated rubber, which may, you know, I, I am well in the camp of like, look, it's got a DOT number. It's got a DOT sticker. It's a street tire. Um, you know, maybe a prep track, probably leave a couple flip flops on the track if you were trying to walk across it. But, um, eight you get there, how you get there. Right. 
I think that, well, I mean, at some point, physics just can't break, right? I mean, we're going to get to that place point. where, you know, it's like zero to 60 and what? It was actually negative. Like, I mean, it's it, actually like, negative. So, so like you soul left right? body. Yeah. There's a, well, there's a time dilation thing happening where like you hit the, you hit the pedal and Stephen Hawking actually reemerges from you know, the, the zone of death to explain this, to you how he is talking to you. The zone the of death. I, I mean, if I you mean, really want to get into it, there's this whole thing about the black hole information paradox. You never really die. Quantum immortality. We can go down that rabbit hole if you want to, but it's a bit much for a show about EV charging. Well, you know, Stephen Hawking is a, is a good, a good example. there. Okay. One of the early EV proponents that thing was right. electric. Exactly. <laughs> he didn't have like a five horsepower Kohler motor on that thing. <laughs> Is well, there's also the Carl Sagan approach of like, well, we're all just star stuff, and if this if this car goes fast enough, you'll just kind of go, poof, and yeah, it'll just be like a, like a supernova or something. But no, I mean, honestly, that that is the cool thing. Speaking is of these... lithium ion battery explosions, <laughs> they oh. finally passed. They finally passed that uh, UL certification law in New York that says you're not allowed to uh, bring in uncertified e bikes or e scooters into New York City. Uh, well, th this is the problem when you have a culture of, yeah, especially mobility for mobility's sake, right? Right. And someone steps up and says, I've got a solution that has micro mobility of, if we could deploy X, Y, and Z, it'll make X amount of millions in X amount of time. And all of a sudden you get gobs of cash thrown at it. And from the technological perspective, people are like, wait, did we double check that? It's like, nah, yeah. we, we've been flying by the seat of our pants for the last you know five, six years on that stuff. I'm glad they passed it. I'm glad they passed it too, but I mean, there's, there's so much that needs to happen and we're going to see it. Like, you know, I, I am a huge fan of the Onyx bikes and the RCR, um, yeah. you know, specifically that bike, I, I think is a phenomenal machine. I ride it every time I go to electrify expo. I, they just can't get me off the stupid thing. Cause I love it so much. Um, but you know, you can't have a 40, 45 mile an hour e-bike with no plates with no kind of licensing no. with no registration you know somebody is going to and you know what's going to happen unfortunately is somebody's going to get hurt there's going to yeah. be a massive lawsuit and then there's going to be regulations and they're going to stop the fun and you know to have some kind of intelligent regulation come out and say like look you can't just have godzillion horsepower you can't just throw earth's cheapest lithium ion battery in there that's separated with tin foil and bubble gum <laughs> You know, like, and, and not that Onyx does that. I'm, I'm singling them out for the power. But I mean, if you look on the other side of it, there are 899 e-bikes out there that do not have UL certified batteries, do not have UL certified chargers, that yeah. do have thermal events. You walk up to them while they're charging and they're super hot. You don't even want to touch them. And I'm yeah. reminded of the early days of smartphones when yeah. people were saying like, you know, you can't take these things at the, you know, don't have this thing out at the gas pump. Don't turn yeah. it on on the airplane. We still have airplane mode because of some of those early Samsungs that were catching on fire with their lithium ion batteries. So to see well, I mean, some intelligence being passed is really exciting. There's there's so much happening in the space of, of mobility and transportation where there is a lack of regulators catching up to the technology. Right. And. It's and the problem is half the time the regulators are spending you know their energy on things that may not actually matter much. I sure. think we're seeing we're seeing you know glimmers of hope in everything from I mean let's let's be honest like um, on you know California side of it related to you know even making sure that there's you know the ability to swipe a credit card at every charging station it's like that's important. Um, but then hammering down on Tesla with autopilot that's important. We need safety there all the way up to like even like trains derailing because. They have antiquated systems for braking that are 50 years old. I mean, there's so many obvious things getting missed. So this little stuff of like, we're just going to deploy 5,000 e-scooters in wherever the heck, and we got them from this supplier that we can't even identify. Yeah, that's bad. But they are like, they're missing the big stuff. So the small stuff slips in the cracks. But your point, then bad things happen. Yeah. So I'm glad. And I'm like, glad you know, if you're like the you one. Yeah. And if you're the one whose apartment burned down because of a faulty battery, it's big stuff to you. You, of course. Well, you, I mean, you, there's, this is where you're looking at micro mobility, especially it's like, what do you do? You pack that thing into your apartment, into your office and you plug it in and something bad happens. Like, what do you do if you're in an, uh, like a very dense urban city center and that thing catches fire and you're on the fourth floor of an eight story you know, apartment building? God knows what, I mean, that, these are things that we have to be very thoughtful around that again, I think regulators, they're just, they're not 
you know, catching up at the same speed as, as what technology is doing in the, indus- in the industry and in the market. And so we're getting those glimmers of, of, you know, the big, the gorillas of the industry saying like a, a California or a New York city saying, this is what we're doing now, by the way. Right. And that it will, that will heavily impact deployments in, in other smaller cities and, and other states that don't have the same kind of muscle to flex. And right. that's important. So. Well, and you see other regulations like, you know, city of Denver is doing a phenomenal job and I actually got to talk to those guys. Uh, so shout out to Ben Shapiro at the Rocky mountain Institute for helping me organize that. Um, you know, they're doing something really clever, which is with their incentive, you have to buy the bike at a local bike shop. So it's yeah. not an incentive where I can go online and, you know, buy, buy it on thing. Amazon or whatever. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, this is something that's been vetted by someone. Because mm-hmm. like you're buying it from a human being. So, you know, you know, so you can kind of go after them if something goes bad and, you know, let's face it, bike shops are run by enthusiasts, right? There's nobody yeah. who opens a bicycle shop because like they don't care. You know, it's like people who buy. <laughs> yeah. Why did you do this? I didn't care. I just wanted to open a yeah, bike. I had it, money. It was either this something. or a pet store. It's like, <laughs> right. But don't buy bikes think that about that. like nobody opens a small business like that because they don't care. Nobody opens an Italian restaurant because they hate food. They're enthusiasts. They're passionate. You know, they're, they're so. enthusiasts and they're passionate, which is, uh, you know, we're going to announce the, uh, Matt Teske EV super center one day soon. I, I know it. <laughs> oh boy. Well, it's, it's, it's interesting to see. Yeah, get, there's a lot of new chatter in the, in the EV world and anybody that's been a part of this industry for a long time, you can see that it's like, wow, there's a lot more people paying attention to this space now. And Whoever, I mean, whoever is the best at messaging will 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 yeah. obviously win with the consumer market. But that doesn't necessarily mean they have the right message or the right product no. or the right service, right? Well, wasn't it so. interesting? Speaking of messaging and kind of bringing this back full circle to Tesla, wasn't mm-hmm. it interesting? I don't know if you saw that op ed piece that said, you know, it was from Ezra Dyer that was, um, if you, you know, if you want to work for a flexible, lean, agile company. You don't go to Tesla, you go to Ford that's 120 years old. And they were talking about how yeah. Ford had that kind of agile startup y movability mindset to it, where Tesla was being run in a very autocratic, top down kind of fashion. And I'm not sure I believe any of that, but yeah. as a piece of PR, it really did the job because it got me thinking about Ford as in the context of being an innovator versus Tesla, which is who we usually think of as being innovative and driving the conversation forward. Well, every company runs a risk of, of not paying attention and becoming complacent over time if they get big enough. Oh right? yeah. And they can have a small company too, but, but for something like a Ford, for example, I can, I guess I see the angle on it because if, Companies that have been that successful over that length of period of time, they understand how to navigate and manage making things happen, whether it's talking about product development or potentially even cultural change. If the cultural change thing doesn't exactly happen all that often, but they know how to make systematic change happen if they need to. And they always they usually prove that with their product development. So if we're talking automotive, for example. But the innovation aspect of it is the harder part. You can't just have PR that talks about we're innovating. You actually have to be doing something innovative. Right. That's where Tesla's, you know, the argument of like, it's very top down and autocratic. It's like, well, there has to be someone with the vision. And that's, sure. and you can, you can say the same thing about Apple, Steve jobs. He was the visionary. He got booted. They didn't do anything remotely creative in the market for like the late eighties and nineties. He gets brought back and boom, vision is back. He dies. Vision goes with him. What I mean, yeah. honestly. And so you have to have that. And that doesn't, so do I agree with like, like as you said, do I agree with that assessment? It's like, well, no, but because you're you're kind of forgetting other important aspects of what what makes that possible, and that innovation comes from the vision, and I, I don't necessarily see that coming from you know legacy brands just yet. They realize they have to pivot, but when they put their mind to pivoting, can they do things very structurally well? I think so. Yeah, uh, and Tesla, you kind of hope they don't get stuck in the Elon. This is just how we do things mindset. But frankly, they are so far ahead of everyone else right now. Still even for software and other things, they still have a little bit of an ability to kind of keep that going, but they still will have to figure out how to pivot at some point. Like everyone else does. It gets that big. So. I know I've been, uh, I, I was, which was really shocking because like, so my last op-ed piece was about, um, 
you know, the depth of talent and the breadth of talent at Tesla and how, you know, if, if Elon got vaporized tomorrow, the company could still soldier on and really keep continue to deliver. I think so. But, and, but like Apple, they would stop innovating. They would maintain where they've gotten to, but I don't know if there's a visionary that could take over like the, the lead, the, you know, the cultish leadership role that Elon has. And, and he just had the brass balls as his ex-wife said, like don't mess with me. He's got big, big brass balls is he had the balls to just try and there's yeah. a lot of people that don't even bother to try because of God knows what fear or everything else. And so that you don't just replace that. So Apple, as an example, after 100%. Jobs died, they have maintained making products and making billions. But since Steve Jobs died in 2011, like over a decade ago, like what have they genuinely done that was innovative? The the Apple Watch? No. I mean, which which again, no. I mean, Siri was released way too. But a hundred percent, you know, I think. I think Tim Cook suffers from the same thing that Elon does. And I honestly think we wouldn't have an Elon Musk without Tim Cook. And why do I say that? That's because you're going to love this. Steve Jobs, one of the things that I think made him a visionary, not only was his view of how all of these things would work together and create that customer experience, but also his idea that it doesn't go into the market until it's perfect. There's a great mm-hmm. story about, you know, he designed that, original fruity iMac and said there, there can't be any visible screws. Well, and that then, was on the original, the original. Mac yeah. The fruity one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, when you say fruity, you mean like the colorful one in the late nineties? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm talking about the original Mac back in like the eighties. He, there was a special tool they had to design to right. actually open it up, but he did carry that forward. But in the fruity one, sure. referring to, but in he the allowed, fruity one, like, there's, yeah, but there's a story it. about that where if you, yeah open if you pick up the handle because those things had a handle yeah because they were yeah. a crt monitor that you could see the screw that held the handle on only if you lifted it and yeah. the, the designer that allowed that to come out got fired because of that not surprising well, said, and this well is- but hang on he's you know he never would have allowed siri as it was into the market the way that tim cook did because Tim Cook right. was trying to push out this idea of like, we're still going forward. We're still innovating, but Siri wasn't ready. And, and Steve Jobs never would have allowed that. And I think that yeah. this idea of putting stuff out into the market, knowing it's not ready. Like now we have Tesla vehicles being delivered with hardware for, uh, you know, HW04, whatever they're calling it and saying that it's not active. We're going to send out a software update later. That's going to activate this stuff. And, you know, calling things beta saying, like, well, it's a beta version. So like you're on your own. Steve Jobs yeah. never would have allowed that to happen. Yeah. Um, and I think that Tim Cook's ability to take over from Apple, push out products that weren't ready and still keep the cash rolling in kind of emboldened people to say, yeah, we can push a beta product into the market and not suffer horrible consequences. That's pro- well. I, I I see your I see the comparison you're making and and what you're explaining. I think that you know in the realm of like Tim Cook was jumping off of uh you know the the iPhone already existed. They were just iterating off of it. Yeah, you know, things the like, iPad things existed. Like, all of that existed. Yeah. yeah, things like Siri. I I get what you're saying there. Um, and but as a as a consumer, I look at that and I go, yeah. And if your phone doesn't work though, it's you know eh, it could be annoying if it doesn't work the way that you want it or whatever. Whereas if your car doesn't work, it could kill you. Yeah. You know, like, you know, so there's, there's a little bit of difference there, I think, but I see what you're pointing to in the sense that, you know, perfection is the enemy of good, you know, in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, but I think part of why, and again, Elon and Tesla, like their software, they're, they're, they, you know, they, they're pretty um, responsive there about like, you know, making updates happen and changing things on the fly. Um, I don't know. I, I think that there's still evidence to me that someone like a jobs, like the whole reality distortion field thing, what he was able to, through being a perfectionist and being just, I don't know, kind of ridiculous for how he got people to get things done, that that created technological greatness in a lot of ways. Sure. And I think that everybody else has been trying to capture that same light, you know, lightning in a bottle when it comes to how consumers respond to that technological amazingness. And he was special that way. And I, I, I don't think Elon is like that. I don't think, um, you know, and, and partly in, in Elon's defense or even in Tim Cook's defense, it's like, like they both have different roles they're playing in the companies that they're at now at this point in time. I think that Apple, it'd be great if they were still innovating, but they just don't have anybody there that's doing it. And if Elon is ever, you know, Hey, I'm no longer CEO of Tesla. Look, 
will they be quote innovating anymore? I don't know, but the stuff that he's been innovating on and pushing forever, like, you know, full self driving in heavy quotes, you know, it's like, that's not genuinely happening the way that he'd hoped. But then if you take a step back and look at how else he's envisioning where the world can go, landing rockets that they can like literally bring them back down from space and land them and not waste billions of dollars on that. That's freaking incredible. I just think it's, I think it's important to keep, keep in mind that, you know, uh, innovation is not a foregone conclusion. Innovation and, is not a foregone conclusion. What? I mean, I think we got to end it right there. Cause I think that's about as good as it gets, right? That's for anything we say from here on out, it's going to be less profound than that. <laughs> Done. Done. And, hey, Hey, the Electrify Expo has seven cities this year, Joe. Tell them where we're going. Oh, my gosh. Well, we're going to be at Long Beach again. Then we're going to go to San Francisco. Then we're going to go across the country to D.C. And then New York and Miami. And then wrap it up at Austin, Texas. We're going to have two industry days. And, uh, you know, I got to tell you, I've been talking to some people about industry day, which now industry day is officially presented by Bridgestone. So we've got to say the Bridgestone industry day at Electrify Expo, uh, which is very exciting stuff. but very, very clear that there is innovation happening throughout this uh, e-mobility experience. And a lot of the innovators are going to be on stage talking about what makes their uh, their stuff really cool. No, and that's, I think, exciting to see how we're, you know, the industry day especially, and you know, Expo is, is exposing the products to the consumer, and industry day is exposing thought leaders to other people in this space. Um, and that's, that's just an important part of the conversation. It's both, you know, B2B and B2C in that way. So I don't know. I'm, I'm excited to see what this year is going to unfold and, and reveal. Maybe it's yeah. going to be amazingly exciting. Maybe, maybe we'll hear some stuff again and rethink it differently. I don't know. Yeah. It's <laughs> think different. Ah, I'm, just look at all, that. I'm just all full of Apple stuff today. All right. That's a wrap. Thanks for listening to the electrifying news podcast brought to you by the creators of electrify expo. Be sure to catch full video episodes on YouTube and follow us on social media platforms at Electrifying News for daily clips, news, and more. 